Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokaw. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the past few videos we've been talking about motor neuron diseases and peripheral nerve conditions. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the major motor end plate condition which is called myasthenia gravis. So this condition is different than all of these others. Okay, so all the way from multiple sclerosis to Charcot-Marie tooth. Um, all of these involve neurons to some extent. Okay, uh, MS involves the central nervous system. Uh, motor neuron diseases, of course, involve the alpha motor neuron. Peripheral nerve conditions are peripheral nerves. But myasthenia gravis does not involve nerves at all. In fact, it just involves the muscular side of the neuromuscular junction. So we're going to go into all this right here in just a few minutes, but let's first understand the mechanism of myasthenia gravis. So what we have here is the neuromuscular junction. Up here, this is our motor neuron. This is the terminal of it. Okay, So up here is axoplasm, and here's the synaptic cleft, specifically called the neuromuscular junction, or NMJ, and down here is the motor end plate of the muscle. Okay, So we're just going to do a basic review of synaptic transmission here. Right here, this is a voltage-gated calcium channel. So what's going to happen here is that action potential, remember, is going to travel along the motor neuron. And it's going to reach that axon terminal. And when it does, it's going to trigger the activation of this voltage-gated calcium channel. So calcium will influx uh, from the extracellular fluid, which is actually the neuromuscular junction or a similar area. And it's going to come into here in the cytoplasm. Now remember, in the cytoplasm here of this axon terminal, we have vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter shown here, acetylcholine. So this calcium, when it starts to influx, it's going to trigger the exocytosis of this vesicle. And that's going to allow the contents, which is acetylcholine, to be dumped into the synaptic cleft. Right? Now remember, on the motor end plate, we have these acetylcholine receptors. Here's one of them right here. Remember that acetylcholine will then diffuse down its concentration gradient and it'll bind to its receptor site on that acetylcholine receptor. Now this particular receptor is an ionotropic receptor, so it, the receptor itself that binds acetylcholine is on the same protein that the ion channel is. So when acetylcholine binds to this receptor, uh, it's going to allow sodium to influx and that sodium is going to move from the extracellular space, which is the neuromuscular junction, into the cytoplasm of the cell, which would actually be sarcoplasm. Okay, so sodium influxes. And the more acetylcholine that you have here bound, the more sodium influx that you have. And so sodium influx is building up here in the cytoplasmic side of the motor end plate. Now over here, I've got a series of voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay? These voltage-gated sodium channels, remember, are activated um, whenever you have sodium in the vicinity of their cytoplasmic domains. So for example, I have sodium here that's in the vicinity of the cytoplasmic domain of this one. And so that's going to trigger the activation of this first voltage-gated sodium channel, and it allows sodium influx. And then sodium builds up here again, activates the next voltage-gated sodium channel, and we get more sodium influx. We get sodium built up here again, it's going to activate the next voltage-gated sodium channel in sequence, and, and so on and so forth. And literally, the sequential activation of these voltage-gated sodium channels along the membrane of that muscle cell, the sarcolemma, that is the muscle cell action potential, which is shown right here. And of course, that muscle cell action potential is going to lead to contraction of that muscle. Now, this is where we're going to start getting into the mechanism of myasthenia gravis. So with myasthenia gravis, we're actually going to see that it is an antibody attack on the acetylcholine receptor. So right here you see a couple antibodies that are bound to the acetylcholine receptor. This is not something we want to happen and that's not normal. It's completely pathologic and what's thought to happen is just over time um, there's an error in synthesizing antibodies and they tend to bind to the acetylcholine receptor. So right here you see antibodies bound to the acetylcholine receptor. These antibodies are made by the host. This is not something you want to happen, this is completely pathologic. And when you have your own antibodies bound to your own protein, well, that's called an autoimmune condition. Myasthenia gravis is one of those. They haven't really worked out the exact cause of this, but something is, is happening with the synthesis of these antibodies, 
and they are erroneously targeting your own protein, specifically the acetylcholine receptor. And when these antibodies tag this protein, like any protein, it's going to lead to the destruction of that protein. Now, I want to be clear about this. This is not an all or none phenomenon. It's not like I either have this receptor or I don't. Okay, it's a graded response. I might start with 1,000 receptors, and over time, maybe I'm down to 800. Maybe then I'm down to 600, and then 500, and 400, and so on and so forth. Um, but again, the less receptors you have, the less you're going to be able to cause muscle contraction. And why is that? Well, again, we can go through all this same stuff here where we get exocytosis of that vesicle containing acetylcholine, but that acetylcholine now doesn't have anything to bind to. So are you going to be able to activate these voltage-gated sodium channels and get an action potential along the muscle cell membrane? No, and that muscle will not be able to contract. Now again, remember I said this is not an all or none thing. So I might go from 1,000 receptors right here down to 500. Okay? Um, so acetylcholine will still be able to bind to some of those receptors that are still there, but you're going to get less of an action potential, and so that's going to manifest as these muscles becoming weak. All right, let's get into the details of myasthenia gravis. What's the loss pattern, particularly for the weakness? Well, it's going to be small muscles that tend to be used repetitively over and over again. Think about that. That's in the face, the neck. Um, you might have some in the limb, in particular the hands. Um, in the face, we're thinking more facial muscles. Um, if you think about your eyelid, uh, the muscle that controls that, levator palpebrae superioris, that's very common to be affected by myasthenia gravis. Okay? Um, it's a very small muscle. It's used repetitively. Those are the type of muscles that tend to see the most effect of this. Okay? Again, one thing we're going to observe biochemically would be antibodies against that acetylcholine receptor. This is also something that can be tested um, in a molecular bio lab. And on a gross scale, you're going to see the weakness in those aforementioned muscles. Um, we're going to look at more specifically which ones um, you might see weakness in in just a second. Now, in terms of the neurological exam, myasthenia gravis is not a neurological condition. Nerves aren't affected, right? Only the muscular part is. That being said, jumping down here for a minute, the muscle tone impairment, you will see hypotonia in these muscles as this disease progresses. Okay? Um, that hypotonia, though, is not a neurological hypotonia, but it would still come out in a neuro exam. So I just want to be clear about that. This is not a neurological condition, but you can still see that hypotonia and that weakness. Okay? Um, this is not hereditary. This is an acquired disease. Again, they're not exactly sure uh, how it's acquired, but somehow the host immune system begins generating antibodies that are able to target those acetylcholine receptors. And so because of that, and it's the host immune system, this is an autoimmune disease. Again, we already talked about this. It's motor end plate, the neuromuscular junction, particularly that acetylcholine receptor. This is not neurological. And because of that, you're not going to see any sensory changes. Okay? Um, this is purely motor. Now, there's no neurological sensory changes. You could have some MSK pain, so some musculoskeletal pain just from fatigue and things like that. But this is not affecting sensory neurons, so there's not going to be any neurological changes in sensation. Okay? Again, the general effect here, we're going to see weakness, especially in those small muscles with repetitive use, in particular ones that are mostly type 1 fibers. Okay, so for example, the levator palpebrae superioris, this elevates the eyelid. Um, whenever you damage the ability of this muscle to contract, you end up with ptosis, drooping of one or both of the eyelids. The extrinsic eye muscles may have failure to move, and so because of that, the person may have diplopia. Facial muscles, if those are affected, for example, frontalis, zygomaticus major, avicularis oris, any of those, um, you'll end up with facial weakness, maybe some drooping on one side. Laryngeal muscles, these are the muscles in the larynx that are partly responsible for your ability to speak. If those are affected, you end up with dysarthria. Pharyngeal muscles, again, those are involved in swallowing. If those are affected, you might not be able to swallow as well. That's dysphagia. Also, some of the deep neck flexors and extensors that are responsible for cervical posture, um, those can be affected, and even muscles in the hand, um, which are responsible for grip, and intrinsic muscles of the feet as well. I don't have those listed here. But again, any one of those small muscles that tends to be with repetitive use, those you're going to see um, the most effective. And one of the things that's going to happen is 
since the person's not going to be able to generate as much force because they have their acetylcholine receptors attacked, uh, they're going to fatigue much more quickly than an average person. As we mentioned, um, in a neurological exam, you will see hypotonia, but it's not a neurological cause because we're not affecting a neuron at all. And again, no neurological sensory changes because we're not affecting any nerves, although the person can have some musculoskeletal pain uh, really resulting from that potential fatigue. Okay, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the mechanism and the presentation of somebody who's having myasthenia gravis. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.